My background's in the energy industry before I came to MIT, and so I um, know about a lot of different problems that, that are inhibiting the changes in the energy system um, that mostly have to do with the fact that we don't really understand chemical reactions. So people know if you cook something a certain way exactly right, you make a certain, you know, make a cake. But no one can tell you, you know, how to make a cake on a computer. It's not, uh, it's not possible yet because we don't understand all the chemical reactions that happen in making a cake. So the same thing happens when you make a fuel um, or you make a new chemical. Um, sometimes people find a recipe that works, but you never really know if it's the best recipe and you don't know what all the different alternatives are. And so you can't intelligently design the system to be as efficient as possible, to have as low an environmental impact as possible. Um, and this is a very important thing for innovation as well. So because you have to do all these experiments, it uh, discourages innovation because you, you might have to put a lot of experimental work in and find out that a system's not going to work, not going to be economical. And so the research managers don't want to do that. They don't want to spend the money for a system that might not work out. So it inhibits them and they don't actually do it. And so that's one of the reasons why the chemical industry and the energy industry have much lower um, innovation rates than, for example, the computer science industry. Um, and so I'm trying to change that. So if we make it possible to do predictions on the computer of what systems are going to work out and which ones are not going to work out, that improves the odds, reduces the risk of making innovation. And so that's very important since energy and chemistry are just such a gigantic part of our economy and have such a huge impact on all the people around the world. So in energy, the money is all in oil. Well, why is that? So partly it's because there's a cartel, but really it's because everybody wants liquid fuels. Liquid fuels are way easier to transport. They have much higher energy density than uh, gaseous fuels do. And solids are almost impossible to handle. So in the old days, people tried to use, run trains, for example, using coal. They had to have the guy in there who was just you know, breaking up the chunks of coal and shoveling it into the furnace. And as soon as they invented diesel locomotives, all the coal ones, you know, people just abandoned them and said, forget it. Let's go to the liquids. So liquid fuels have a huge advantage. And you see that in the marketplace, that the prices of liquid fuels are about 10 times the price for the equivalent energy of, of coal, and maybe five times that of uh, natural gas. So liquid fuels are where the money is. It's like maybe 90% of the money in the energy business is all liquid fuels. And also the equipment that burn liquid fuels, like cars and airplanes, uh, even your furnaces and your houses here in Massachusetts, um, that's a lot of capital investment in liquid fuel. So if you can make another liquid fuel, you can make a lot more money than you can with any other kind of fuel. So I think if any alternative fuel uh, succeeds in the marketplace, it's almost certainly going to be a liquid fuel. Also, if you look at the production of liquid fuels, um, we're much further into burning the re known re reserves of liquid fuels than we are with the other kinds of fuels. So they're more likely to run out. And as the countries like chi China and India, um, their populations start to have cars, they're going to want to a lot more liquid fuel than they got now. So that's really um, going to drive the price up even further. So if you have some new fuel and you're trying to break into the marketplace, you definitely want to be making a liquid fuel. So that's where you're going to make some money. And that pays for all the research and for the development of the new technology to make it. So we've been doing that. And actually, our country um, uh, suffered an embargo uh, liquid fuels from the Arabs back in the 1970s. And uh, Germany uh, was blockaded a couple times in the world wars. And people saw how effective it was to blockade liquid fuels. And so there's a lot of uh, interest in um, trying to make sure that won't happen again. So the military is very interested uh, to make sure that liquid fuels would be readily available with materials we have in North America um, and not to have to import them across the ocean in case there's a war, for example. So for all those reasons, so liquid fuels are really the, the primo thing to go after. Uh, in the previous administration, uh, the Bush administration, there was really a lot of interest in trying to use hydrogen as the main fuel. I think um, most people decide that's not going to work out um, because of the low energy density and the difficult of, difficulty of the infrastructure to try to distribute hydrogen, at least not going to work out in the short term. And so uh, we were working on that for the purpose of could you take the hydrogen and use that to treat, for example, biomass to hydrogenate it and that way you can get rid of some of the oxygen. Biomass is a problem that has a lot of oxygen in it, so it makes the energy density very low. And um, so if you can hydro treat it first, you can make it more similar to liquid fuels we have now and that uh, they work a lot better. So, but you need a source of hydrogen. So the obvious way to get hydrogen is to use natural gas. That's the, the, the way it's done now, but that emits a lot of CO2. So we're trying to develop a new technology for um, making hydrogen from natural gas by capturing the CO2 uh, so we could sequester it under the ground and that would reduce the greenhouse effect of it. 
So that was interesting. That was um, also trying to see capability-wise, could we um, could we predict catalytic chemistry the same way we can predict fuel chemistry? So right now we have very good capability to calculate all the reaction rates for all the fuels and to understand all the reactions. But when you get catalysts, people don't know much about how they work. And so that was my first foray into trying to calculate all the details of the chemical reaction of the catalyst. So we figured out what all the intermediates were, all the reactions, how could you change the catalyst to try to influence the reaction, and we could uh, follow it down in detail. And so that was uh, part of that project was developing the capability to do it. That worked out pretty well.